Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Let's get started and look into our daily quiz. Before we start with the practice questions for the day, a quick gentle reminder. Baiju's Exam Prep IAS has already launched its official Telegram channel. If you've not yet joined the channel, please do join so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's look into the first question. Consider the following statements. Article 127 of the Indian Constitution proposes that when a quorum of permanent judges is needed to continue or hold a Supreme Court session, the President can nominate the High Court judge as an ad hoc Supreme Court judge for a specified time. The ad hoc judge in India carries all of the power, authorities and advantages and the obligations of a Supreme Court judge. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is two only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the ad hoc judges. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into the first statement, it is not the president who nominates a high court judge as an ad hoc Supreme Court judge, but instead it is the Chief Justice of India. So the first statement is wrong. When you look at the ad hoc judges, there are two important criteria. The first criteria is this will require the consent of the president. So the previous consent of the president is required and at the same time, let's say there is one of the judges from the state of Maharashtra who is working in the High Court of Bombay who has to be appointed as an ad hoc judge of the Supreme Court. In that case, the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, his permission will also have to be taken. That is, he may also have to be consulted as well. So, what are the two important criteria? One, the previous consent of the president and also consulting the chief judge of the High Court. The judge selected for this post should be eligible to serve on the Indian Supreme Court. What does this mean? This means that if a person is getting appointed as the ad hoc Supreme Court judge, he should have fulfilled all the criteria that is required for him to be appointed as as the Supreme Court judge. Only then he can be appointed as the ad hoc Supreme Court judge. It is the responsibility of the judge thus designated to attend the Supreme Court sessions first and foremost above his other obligations and while doing so all the powers that have been accommodated and given to the judge of the Supreme Court. The same powers will also be given to this ad hoc judge who is appointed by the CJI. It is this that we have to understand. Now let's look into the next practice question. Which of the following statements about the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 is are correct? The act provides for the protection of the country's wild animals, birds and plant species in order to ensure environmental and ecological security. The National Board for Wildlife and National Tiger Conservation Authority were constituted as statutory organizations under the provisions of the act. Schedule 6 of the act consists of animals that are considered as vermin which can be hunted freely. Which of the statements are correct? The answer to this is 1 and 2 only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Hindu makes a reference to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Let us try and understand what are these statements. When you look into this third statement, it reads, Schedule 6 of the Act consists of animals that are considered as vermin which can be hunted freely. This statement is wrong. Why? That is because Schedule 6 speaks about plants that are forbidden from cultivation. This includes examples like pitcher plant, blue vanda, red vanda, kut, so on and so forth. So Schedule 1 consists of species that are endangered. Schedule 2 consists of animals that are accorded high protection. Their trade is prohibited. Schedule 3 and 4, this list is for the species that are not endangered. And Schedule 5, this contains that can be hunted. So it is the vermin which are placed under Schedule 5 and not under Schedule 6. So Schedule 6 is basically about those plants that are forbidden from cultivation. When you look into the first statement, the Act provides for the protection of countries, wild animals, birds and plants. Yes, it includes animals, birds as well as plant species. So the first statement is right. When you look into the second statement, yes, the National Board for Wildlife is constituted. We have one of the sections called as Section 5A, uh, the Constitution of National Board 
support for the wildlife yes it is under this act and we also have a chapter that is chapter 4b which speaks about national tiger conservation authority so as a result the second statement is also right as well so the national board for wildlife which is under section 5a and we also have a part in this act so these are constituted under the provisions of the act so the second statement is also right since the first and second are right the third statement is wrong the answer to this would be a now let's look into the next practice question which of the following central asian country is not a part of international north south transport corridor tajikistan kazakhstan kyrgyzstan turkmenistan the answer to this is turkmenistan why have we taken this practice question because this article on the indian express makes a reference to the instc so when we speak about instc who are the founding members we have russia india and iran who are the founding members of the instc the agreement was signed in 2002 there are 13 member states of instc project this includes india iran russia azerbaijan armenia kazakhstan belarus tajikistan Kyrgyzstan, Oman, Turkey, Syria as well as Ukraine. Do we have Turkmenistan in this? No. Since Turkmenistan is not part of INSTC, the answer to this would be D. So remember, Turkmenistan is not part of International North-South Transport Corridor. Now let's look into the next practice question. Consider the following statement. The constitution of India has laid down the technical criterion for a party to be recognized as a national party. A political party would be considered a national party if it is recognized in four or more states or if its candidates polled at least 6% of total valid votes in any four or more states in the last Lok Sabha or assembly elections and has at least four MPs in the last Lok Sabha polls or if it has won at least 2% of the total seats in the Lok Sabha from not less than three states. Which of the statements given above is are correct? The answer to this is two only. Why have we taken this practice question? Because this article on the Indian Express makes a reference to the national party. What is the context to this? We have the Ahmadmi political party, which has become the new political party to be given the tag of the national party. So once we have the official declaration made by the election commission, it will be given this tag. What is this national party? What is the criterion that they have to meet? What are the advantages has been discussed as part of the big news today. So please look into it. When you look into the first statement, the constitution of India has laid down the technical criterion for a party to be recognized as a national party. This is a wrong statement. So this is not given in the constitution. This is nowhere given in the constitution. So the first statement is wrong. The second statement is right that if a political party meets any of this criteria, it can be one criteria, it can be two or even a single criteria out of the three. In that case, a political party can become a national political party. For example, if you look at Ahmadmi political party, it has its presence in Delhi. It has its presence in Punjab because both these state and the union territory, they already formed the government. Then it has its presence in Goba and now in the state of Gujarat. And since it has got a vote share of more than 12% and meeting the criteria of one of the regional political parties and is a pol regional political party in four states, that is, including a union territory that is why it has now been given a national party status do note we have an entire analysis for the same on our big news so kindly look into it now let's look into the next practice question consider the following pairs we have the country on one side important reason for being in the news recently chad setting up a permanent military base by china guinea suspension of constitution and government by military lebanon severe and prolonged economic depression tunisia suspension of parliament by president how many pairs given above are correctly matched the answer to this is only three pairs this happens to be a previous year question from the year 2022. So which statement is wrong? It is the first statement which is incorrectly matched. When you look into the chat, setting up a permanent military base by China, this is a wrong statement. It is not in chat. Instead, it is Equatorial Guinea, which is why the first statement is wrong. The other statements are right 
and the answer to this would be only three pairs which is nothing but three now let's look into the fact of the day the fact of the day for today's discussion is election security deposit let us try and understand what is this article all about what is this election security deposit we have one of the important laws in the country which is nothing but the representation of the people's act of 1951 it comes up with what is called as the election deposit what is this election deposit let's say for example i am a person who's contesting from one of the constituencies let's say for example delhi north i am contesting from delhi north so what is that i have to do whenever i go file my nominations apart from filing the papers and proposals and other things as formalities i also will have to pay certain amount this will be with the reserve bank of india it will be with the government treasury why that is because the representation of the people's act clearly mandates that a candidate contesting the elections apart from following the formalities will also have to give election deposit so it is mandatory for every candidate who is contesting a parliamentary or assembly election to deposit a certain security amount an election security deposit is that particular amount which will be returned if that particular person is able to garner one sixth of the valid oath where do we have it we have it in one of the sections we have one of the sections of the representation of the people's act called a section 34 a candidate shall not be deemed to be duly nominated for election from a constituency unless he deposits or causes to be deposited in case of an election from a parliamentary constituency a sum of 25000 rupees or where a candidate is a member of scheduled caste or scheduled tribe a sum of 12500 rupees so if he is contesting as an MP that is he wants to become an MP for an MP constituency he has to deposit 25,000 if it is for the assembly elections let's say he is wanting to contest as an MLA candidate in that case he has to pay a deposit of about 10,000 rupees and if the candidate is from a scheduled caste or a scheduled tribe a sum of 5,000 rupees will have to be deposited and when it comes to the presidential and the vice presidential elections it is about 15,000 that have to be deposited for the presidential as well as the vice president elections when will the candidate lose his deposits let's say for example there is one of the candidate this candidate is not able to get one sixth of the valid oaths in that case that person will not be getting the security deposit let's say i have given the security deposit for one of the mla constituencies i want to become an mla so i do pay up the security deposit i would have paid about 10000 so if i am not able to get one sixth of the total valid oath in that case my security deposit will be forfeited which means the election commission will not give back this money that i had paid initially to the election commission which will be in the government treasury this basically means that if a person who goes on to win the election for this person he can become an mp he'll become an mla for this person the security deposit will be given if there is a person who's got valid oath one sixth of the valid oath for such person as well the election commission of india will return the money but for those who have less than one sixth of the voting of valid oath for such people what he'll not get is this election deposit so if a candidate does not meet the threshold that is one sixth in that case money will not be given but if a candidate withdraws the nomination or passes away before the polls the amount is returned as well what is the section we have section 158 which speaks about return of forfeiture of candidates deposit the deposit made under section 34 or under section red with subsection of 39 shall either be returned to the person making it or his legal representative or be forfeited to the appropriate authority in accordance with the provisions of this section if the candidate is not shown in the list of contesting candidates or if he dies before the commencement of the poll the deposit shall be returned as soon as practicable after the publication of the list after his death as the case may be so if he is able to get one sixth vote or if he wins security deposit would be given if he does not get one sixth vote his security would be taken away and if he passes away or if he withdraws before contesting the elections his money will also be written as well now the question is 
what are the challenges with this particular proposal we know for the fact that large number of people contest elections 10000 or 25000 that is kept as the money for the security deposits is actually very less as well this is not preventing number of people to stop from contesting and at the same time there are number of people who also contest the elections these people contest the elections that is because they expect that if they put up their names for the nomination there are political parties these political parties will pay such candidates a higher amount so they may give 50000 or 1 lakh and they may ask that political candidate to withdraw themselves so they are getting more from the political parties which is why these candidates actually contest the elections they do not worry about the 10000 or the 25000 because they feel that if a major political party is contesting that candidate will pay this person a greater amount so that this person withdraws from the nomination why is all this being done that is because to make sure that these people who are not serious about contesting elections do not contest the elections that is the primary idea or the objective of coming up with this election deposit it is this that we have to understand with respect to this topic so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best